it's really nice to see you, to have you, Timothy, in the seminar, and uh, right. the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Heike, and uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Great pleasure for me. Can I also first start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today? I'm at home in Kuji, um, and I want to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal Bejigal people, and pay my respects to uh, Aboriginal elders past, present, and also to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are with us here today. Um, it is a great pleasure. It's actually since I've come to UNSW two and a half years ago, it's the first time I've given a seminar paper. So my apologies, first of all, that I've been so slow in getting this done, but you know, pressures of the job and all that. Um, but, but now here I am uh, going to present some work to you today. And first thing I'm going to do in the classic, classic move is go to um, screen share. And I hope that's the right one I have chosen. Um, okay. Apologies, I'm just moving something around so I can. That's correct. Okay, I'm assuming that is, yes, we're in full screen mode. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so, so ends of, the ends of critique Transforming Ethical Sensibility is, is my talk. Um, we've already used up a bit of time, so I'm really aiming to go, I guess I wanna, I wanna stop before 1.30 anyway, so that we have at least half an hour for discussion and questions, because I always think that's the, pretty much the best part um, of a seminar of this nature with a, with a group of scholars in a, in a department of school, university like ours. So I wanna keep plenty of time for that. So I'm gonna try to have, have three parts in my talk. And so I'm gonna aim for roughly 12, 15 minutes for each part. I'll try and stick to that. This is my first time giving a PowerPoint based Zoom medium talk. So um, I have tried to calculate how long this will, this, it will take me, but there may be errors. We'll see how, we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, so, so the title of the talk, The Ends of Critique, Transforming Ethical Experience, Ethical Sensibility, let me just give you a little bit of background, first of all. So first of all, th th this talk is, is based on a chapter that I'm contributing to a book, which I'm also co-editing. Now I've just lost my other source of the talk. Apologies. I'm also working, I have actually three devices on here to make this work. Um, so it's, it's a book called The Ends of Critique, Methods, Institutions, and Politics, which I'm one of the co-editors of. Um, it's part of a book series called New Critical Humanities, which I'm co-general editor of this new book series, book series called New Critical Humanities, along with my other co-editors there who are Birgit Kaiser and Catherine Thiel, both of whom are at the University of Utrecht. Um, so a quick shout out, first of all, and uh, plugging this series, we're especially keen for early career researchers and anyone really um, to offer us manuscripts. If, if you wanna be published in this, you just Google Roman Littlefield, New Critical Humanities, you will find the description of the series um, and information on how to get in touch with us. So, so that's first part of the background. Second part of the background is basically around this idea of critique and what, why am I talking about that? And why is this book, The Ends of Critique, talking about that today? Um, and I guess that context is basically in this world we live in in which the critical humanities and social sciences are under attack, especially in Australia, as we know at the moment, but. Um, much more widespread than that, of course. Um, and a world in which also, on the other hand, we have universities priding themselves or selling themselves as teaching something they call, we call critical thinking. Um, I think that we can't help but ask, what, what does that actually mean? What do maybe, I'm not gonna to talk today about how what we call critical thinking might relate to what I'm calling critique, but that is an area for further question, maybe even discussion, if people want to bring that up in the discussion afterwards. Um, and then I guess a follow on or another way to put that question would be if, um, as some people might say, critique is so, let's say, powerless, or if one sometimes feels despairingly that it is powerless, then why is it that, for instance, governments seem to be so hostile to it? Why would they be hostile to something that is potentially is so powerless? Um, what, what's going on with it, really? So that's part of the background. The next part of the background is... Um, is really to say that, so, so what I'm doing in the project that I have is 
or what I'm going to present here is one version of or one way of presenting what critique is. So critique, of course, does many things. There are many ends of critique. And that diversity of critique can, of course, be described in a wild, widely diverse range of theoretical lenses from maybe Nietzschean or Foucauldian genealogy to a Derridian deconstruction to deluso guitarian schizoanalysis to a Frankfurt st School style ideology critique and no doubt many others. Um, I want to acknowledge that breadth of that diversity and I'm not going to make any pretense to being exhaustive or I certainly don't want to be, pres be prescriptive in what I'm presenting here. But what I want to offer is one way of describing what I think is one of the things that critique can do. Um, and that is what you have here on the screen, which is one of the ends of critique the way I'm presenting it is, is to carry out a transformative engagement with the ethical sensibilities of our time. Um, and I hope that by the end of today's talk, you will have a better sense of what I mean by that transformative engagement and what I mean by the ethical sensibilities of our time and what that critical engagement might actually result in or what forms it can take. Um, final bit of background I want to acknowledge, and Heike's already pointed out that I've done a lot of work on Foucault, and this paper is not on Foucault, it draws on Foucault, as we'll see in a couple of places. But nonetheless, certainly for my approach to critique, Foucault, the Foucauldian approach is sort of always there, uh, underlying what I'm doing. Not so much, I was going to say in the background, it's not in the background, it's, it's in the foreground, it's just not always highlighted. Um, and I thought it might be helpful for this talk today to just give you a quote that I think sort of encapsulates the broad idea of critique that I am working within here. And this is a quote from Foucault's, um, actually it's a, it's a seminar paper that Foucault himself gave in a French philosophy society seminar in 1979, which is published under the title, What is Critique? And he gives this definition, temporary limited, definition of critique. Critique, he says, is the art of, invo the art of voluntary in servitude of reflective indocility. And the essential function of critique is that of desubjectification in the game of what one could call the politics of truth. So I just want to have highlighted three of those terms, desubjectification, politics, truth. So somehow critique operates within that triangle between desubjectification or desubjectivation um, and politics and truth. And those three things, for those of you with familiarity with Foucault, will know that those three things correspond to an, you know, the, 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 the different forms of this tripartite approach that Foucault develops, uh, which might be in these, you might phrase it in, in, in it here in terms of ethics corresponding with desubjectification, power corresponding with politics, and knowledge corresponding with truth. So it's somewhere between the, the interactions between ethics, power, and knowledge, and or between desubjectification and politics and truth. It's in there that critique does its work. So that's the broad um, context. And I wanted to acknowledge that background here. So what am I going to do today is there's three parts in this talk. I'm going to aim to give roughly 10, 12, 15 minutes for each part, hopefully equally. We'll see um, the three parts, they're not necessarily um, sort of extra extraordinarily well tied together in this version of the talk, but really what I wanted to give you was just these three components and then we can have a discussion about how those three components might relate to each other or how they might help to contribute to a particular concept or a particular way of actually practicing critique. Um, and the three parts are, so part one, uh, part one is around the idea of vivisection. So first, so what I want to do is to explore some of the range of meanings of vivisection in the 19th century, both literally and metaphorically. Now, first of all, I'll say that the, the written version of this paper does engage with some of the literal meaning of vivisection, the development of that concept in the 19th century. This version of the paper doesn't. Um, I've had to leave that out. But what I will talk about today is the way that vivisection was then used metaphorically by Nietzsche at the same time as vivisection is emerging as a scientific methodology. It's being used by Nietzsche as this um, metaphor he has for critique, especially in his work in the 1880s. And that's what I'm just gonna pick up a little bit on that in today's talk. Um, and really just, I just wanna put it out there as, a, as another possible metaphor, another possible way of understanding critique, not the one and only, 
but one way of understanding what critique does. Um, and with the addition here of the idea of it being an experimental vivisection, and the experimental is always extremely important uh, for Nietzsche, it's important for Foucault, it's important for this tradition that I'm working within. Uh, part two, um, so in part two, what I'm going to, one, one thing I say in general is that critique and critical vivisection is something that doesn't only happen in works of philosophy, thankfully. Uh, it's something that doesn't only happen in works, in works of scholarship, in works that are ostensibly works of critique. It also, I believe, happens in, in artworks, particularly in works of literary art or literary works. Um, so that for me, that's a kind of fundamental tenet and my idea about critique is that it also happens in other domains. And one of those domains that is of great interest to me is the literary domain. So what I wanna do in the second part is to say a few things about this novel, very recent novel from 2018 called Milkman by Anna Burns, uh, which actually won the Booker Prize in 2018. Um, and I'm gonna present that or an aspect of that as a kind of an implement, as, a, as an example of um, critical vivisection at work in a literary domain, critical vivisection of ethical sensibility. Um, third, third part of the paper, I'm going to basically be saying that, so kind of bring these, bring these elements together. And I'm going to propose that the idea of an experimental, that that idea of an experimental engagement with ethical sensibility gives us a very rich and productive way of understanding one of the ends of critique. Um, and sorry, just go back. So in, in that final section, I'm gonna be considering some of the grounds of possibility and the possible effects of a critical experimental intervention in ethical sensibility, whether that's something that occurs in a novel or in a work of academic scholarship or philosophy and so on. Um, so in other words, I'm gonna kind of try to bring that together and how, how that would intervene in modes of subjectivity in the domain of ethics. And I do all of that in the full awareness that um, that there will be lots of open, lots of openings, let's say, in this text. This is a porous, I hope, presentation, which gives lots of room for people to intervene and ask questions and um, move what I am doing. So it is by no means, even for me, set in stone what I'm doing here. Okay, so, so the first part, vivisection, which should be literal and metaphorical, but as I said, I'm dropping off the literal part for today's purposes. Um, so in the late 19th century, at the time when Nietzsche first uses vivisection, as a metaphor was also, as I said, a new and highly controversial method of medical research. So, so the experimentation on living animals for the purposes of medical research was a very new controversial practice in the early mid 19th century. Um, and it's something that is widely debated um, in, in society across Western Europe at the time, in circles around Nietzsche, in circles around Wagner, in which Nietzsche was still involved in at this time. Um, you know, people were divided between whether one was pro or anti vivisection. Now, we're going to leave the literal, those debates, medical debates, to one side for the moment and just, draw, just want to draw attention really to the, the fact, to the way in which Nietzsche uses it as a metaphor for, in his work. So in the 1880s, vivisection becomes one of his, I would say, one of his favorite metaphors for the critical work of philosophy. And it hasn't received, I think it hasn't received a great deal of attention in Nietzsche scholarship. I'm not do not present myself as a Nietzsche scholar, do not read German, I'm not a Nietzsche scholar, so I'm not 100% sure of this, but I, don't, I have the feeling that there's not a great deal of focus on that. There is some, but not a great deal. But it's, it's there as something that runs through that work from the 1880s, principally these three works on, on ethics, three key works by Nietzsche, Daybreak, uh, Beyond Good and Evil, and On the Genealogy of Morality. And those are the works that I'll kind of be drawing on for this, um, for the purposes today. Um, so in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche suggests that the time has come, and in general, his project is he suggests the time has come to reject the system building of, more, of the moral philosophers and to undertake what he calls a much more modest task. What would be necessary, he says, for a long time in the study of morality will be, quote, collecting material, formulating concepts and putting into order the tremendous realm of tender feelings and value distinctions that live, grow, reproduce and are destroyed. So, so what Nietzsche is saying is that we have to stop this philosophical system building and we have to focus on the kind of the nitty gritty of the, the kinds of feelings and value distinctions that we have as human beings that are living, growing, reproducing and being destroyed. In other words, I mean, again, putting 
looking back at this through a Foucauldian uh, lens, we would say that this is kind of equivalent to what Foucault later on in a different context calls the microphysics of power. So rather than looking at the large overarching uh, phenomena, you have to begin with the tiny microphysics, as Foucault does say in Discipline and Punish, you begin with how is the child sitting in the desk at school? How is the prisoner spending his or her day? You begin with those little things. And Nietzsche is doing that, making the same proposal, the same um, suggestion in the 1880s. He's saying rather than that system building, we need this micro focus, collecting material, formulating concepts, focusing on this tremendous realm of tender feelings and value distinctions that live, grow, reproduce, and are destroyed. And that's crucial that this is a constantly changing. So that moral realm and the moral feelings is a constantly changing domain for human beings. And that's what we need to focus on. We philosophers for Nietzsche here in this context. Um, it's only then he suggests that we will be able to sketch what he calls the recurring and more frequent shapes of this living crystallization. So again, we have to begin with this micro level and then maybe we can begin to identify the patterns of the shifting crystallization um, of these larger shapes and cultural forms that, that grow and recede over time. Um, and going further, so on that basis, Nietzsche, does, and the, in fact, in the same section of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche describes his work as a kind of vivisection, as a slow and careful dissection, he says, of the faith in a single univocal morality. Quote, the examination, dissection, interrogation, vivisection of this article of faith, that is the faith in one morality. So if we believe in one morality, what do we have to do as a critical philosopher? You have to examine, dissect, interrogate, and vivisect that article of faith. What does that mean? Um, I mean, I, I hope during this talk, we get some sense of what that might mean as the vivisection element of that. Um, there is something crucial here, of course, about the in vivo element of it. It's a living experiment on a living set of tender feelings and how those grow, develop, and change. That's what Nietzsche is asking us to focus on. Um, and that investigation, he says, and he acknowledges in a different work in Human All Too Human, he says that that investigation requires not only patience, but also courage on the part of the investigator, the researcher, um, and requires courage because vivisection, he says, evinces or provokes an unavoidable horror. But he says, mankind cannot be spared the horrible sight of the psychological operating table with its knives and forceps. So again, for, for Nietzsche, there's this real shifting of this, the literal um, modes of vivisection, which are really sort of front of mind for a lot of people in the 1870s and 1880s in Western Europe. Um, and he transfers that sense of that engagement, of that intervention into the philosophical domain as a metaphor for that philosophical critique, especially in the, in the domain of ethics. Um, okay, so, so the, the um, yes. So the, the vivisection, in, what, one thing I wanna stress here though, is that in 19th century medical science, uh, vivisection wasn't just a tool of observation. It also had a potentially significant role in experiment. Um, experiment as understood in a different, more creative sense. So it wasn't just experiment to gain the knowledge of this static thing that you're observing. Um, it was also experiment in the sense of creating, changing, modifying living forms. So vivisection also had that had that, had that level of meaning. And that's something that you see, for instance, another cultural product of this time would be H.G. Wells's novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, which is from 1896. H.G. Wells himself was actually a um, science writer, popular science writer, public science intellectual, who was very much in favor of vivisection, but he wrote that novel about this protagonist, Dr. Moreau, who's actually engaged in grotesque experiments on animals in order to create a new race of beings, which, which would be somehow either between animals and human beings or maybe beyond human beings. Certainly H.G. Wells' presentation of Moreau, Moreau is maybe some kind of demented, uh, perverted Nietzschean overman who is creating this new mode of being, which would be beyond human and beyond animal. Um, so in any case, that, that idea of the experiment in the sense of creation is very much there in the 19th century. And it's obviously there in Nietzsche in many different ways. Um, the idea of Nietzsche, you know, is constantly appealing to that, the ideas of experiment, test, attempt, 
as essential in, um, in the practice of the philosopher. Um, so that drive that drive to create the new human being, as I said, is there in Nietzsche, it's there very explicitly in his idea of the Ubermensch, but it's there in general throughout his, all of his all of his ethical, critical ethical work. Um, and it's also there in that tradition that appeals back to Nietzsche or is inspired by Nietzsche, for example, in Foucault, it's very strong element in Foucault's idea of critical philosophy and enlightenment. It's in that essay of just reference what is critique. It's in his slightly later essay, what is enlightenment as well, that there has to be this experimental aspect to the work of critique. Critique means nothing if it's a purely intellectual exercise. It has to have an experimental aspect to it, transformational aspect to it. Um, <clears throat> For Nietzsche, now there's other compli complications in Nietzsche, which I'm not going to go into here, which is, which is, um, let me leave that blank for a second. Other complications in Nietzsche and the genealogy of morality, of course, for Nietzsche, human, human history, we go through a certain mode of self-modification, which turns us into a certain kind of being, which is not necessarily the kind of being that Nietzsche wants us to be. But now we have the potential to turn ourselves into another kind of human being to move beyond good and evil, beyond the traditional, especially Christian ethics. Um, so for, for Nietzsche, vivisection, there's certainly an acknowledgement in Nietzsche that vivisection is, we could say, a double-edged sword, right? Um, it's both a torturer and a potential liberator of human beings. And in fact, in some sense, we get our liberation for Nietzsche, we get our liberation through the torture. Um, as he says, we have to be faced with the sight of the operating table. And again, that's something you see in H.G. Wells, the character Dr. Moreau is, you know, all about we have to get through the pain. Pain is a sign of being an inferior being. We need to go through the pain, experience it in order to come out as some other kind of being. And that's very much in that, in that way of thinking. Um, for Nietzsche, that hubris then is part of that human experiment. Human self-experimentation is, has that level or that that tone of hubris that we see in Dr. Moreau in a different form. Nietzsche in On the Genealogy of Morality, obviously not referencing Dr. Moreau at all, since this is 10 years before Dr. Moreau was written. Nietzsche says, hubris characterizes our attitude towards ourselves for we experiment on ourselves in a way we would never allow on animals. We merrily vivisect our souls out of curiosity. So that's the a really, you know, sort of neat uh, expression by Nietzsche of that idea that we are carrying out the vivisection on ourselves, even more so, more in a more experimental and outlandish and daring way than we ever dare to do, in fact, on animals. And that, for Nietzsche, that causes us pain, but it leads to something which for him is of value. So all, what I want to do in this section really then is to just make that point that that concept of vivisection is, first of all, a constant First of all, the concept of vivisection as an element in an experimental intervention is the concept that I think is really appealing for Nietzsche. So Nietzsche catches on to this um, concept, which is in the air, as it were, in the late 19th century Western Europe. It's appealing to him because it has that element of experimental intervention. Um, and I think it's also potentially for that same reason has that um, is evocative also then for the critical tradition that comes after Nietzsche in, in that is inspired by Nietzsche. So vivisection is a metaphor that I think for, for Nietzsche per se operates on, on several levels at once. First of all, it's, it's timely in the sense that it is very much an issue of the day, but also it's untimely in the sense that it, des it designates a brushing against the grain of the present. So Nietzsche always wants us to be untimely in our critique. Um, secondly, it's a practice that philosophers have always cultivated in his view. And he describes Socrates as kind of the great original self vivisector. Um, but it's also a practice that must be revived anew in the project of, of the Nietzschean, Nietzsche's project of the revaluation of values. So it's always been there as an element in the philosophical tradition, but it needs to be reimagined, refocused, and, and renewed in, Nietzsche, in Nietzsche's own, own project of a revaluation of values. And finally, it entails cruelty and pain, but it's also a necessary step in this experimental pursuit of a higher form of gay science, which of course is a reference to a title of another one of, an, someone is calling me on Teams, which is another uh, title of another book by Nietzsche, of course, The Gay Science. Okay, I'm gonna leave that there. We're doing a time, not too bad. So that, that, that's part one, framing that 
the way Nietzsche uses the metaphor um, and just putting that out there really as a way, one way of thinking about critique and what critique might be about. <clears throat> uh, part two, so part two, I'm gonna present this novel Milkman as basically a novel experiment. So an experiment in that sense, but in the form of a, of a work of literature. Um, so as I said, I'm, my general over, overarching point is that works of literature do engage in critique um, in, you know, as often as I believe the, the canonical works of critique, whether those canonical works of critique are in, in philosophy, in history, in gender studies and feminism in whatever area that those works are in, I think this also is happening and always has happened, I would say in literature, not in all literature, but in some literature. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on is this novel, Milkman. So this novel, um, in, in one sense, this novel is set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, as they are called, which is the period from 1968 to 1998 of um, pretty intense sectarian violence and uh, paramilitary activity and violence between different paramilitary groups, Republican and Unionist, and of course, also the British Army as well. So it was a very complex, very violent period of time in Northern Ireland. Belfast, one of the centers of that. The novel is, is in some sense, as I said, set in that. It's maybe set in the Catholic neighborhood of Belfast called the Ardoin, uh, which is actually where Anna Burns herself grew up in the 1970s. In other words, right at the, at the, at the height and the most intense moment of this um, sectarian, this period of political violence, sectarian violence, and so on and paramilitary violence and military violence too. Um, one of the most striking features of the novel though is that none of these places are actually named in the novel. And in fact, the novel is almost completely devoid of proper names of any kind. No country, no neighborhood, no political leader is named in the book. So which is why I say it is set in Northern Ireland. Actually, there is no evidence whatsoever in the book, direct evidence that it is set there or for that matter, anywhere else. Um, and that's one of the features that for me is an extremely interesting feature of this book as an experimental intervention is, is precisely that absence of names in the book. Um, so not only the absence of place names, there is no Belfast, there is no Ireland, there is no United Kingdom, but there's, no, there's none of that. There's also um, none of the characters in the novel are named. Um, so char no character, one exception, which we'll see in a second, are named. Uh, everyone comes with these sometimes amusing, sometimes not, not so you know, humorous um, versions of a name, monikers such as second brother-in-law, tablets girl, maybe boyfriend, milkman. And there are actually two people referred to as milkman, one of whom is real milkman and the other one is not real milkman. There's a character who's referred to as nuclear boy. There is, believe it or not, a somebody makes somebody. All right, so everyone in this book has a name of that nature. They don't have real given names, proper names. Uh, the one exception to that rule, uh, which kind of proves the rule, is a married couple who are ironically humorously referred to as Nigel and Jason. Nigel and Jason, a um, non-same-sex married couple, are so named because they are the keepers of the list of unacceptable given names in this community. That is the names that are too closely associated with the unnamed country, which is the country over the water. Uh, and the prime examples of those, those um, forbidden names are Nigel and Jason, Helps the two people who, who hold that list, as it were, are called themselves Nigel and Jason. So they're the only people who are named in the novel. Um, as I said, that, that for me is a really interesting part, I mean, really interesting formal feature of the novel that I think has effects that I want to quickly talk about. Some of, some of the, the effects of that are. Um, I and I want to identify three, three impacts of that, of the removal of proper names. First of all, it means that all, all of the cultural political specificity of that period in Northern Ireland's history can be left to one side. So, you know, you might pick this book up and you might, somebody might have said, it's said in Northern Ireland. I don't remember how, I hadn't read reviews of it. I don't remember how I knew, quote unquote, that it was set in Northern Ireland. Um, one gets this idea, you read any review of it, it will talk about Northern Ireland. But none of that is there is explicitly named. I think what that does is it basically makes the book, make, it, it 
it means that a reader who has no knowledge of that conflict will not be at a loss in reading the novel, okay? It's not necessary to know about the history of 1970 uh, Irish politics, or it's not necessary to know the last 400 or 700 years of British-Irish relations to understand the novel. You just, you inhabit that world and the novel will tell you everything you need to know about that experience without naming it. Um, and as Burns herself has said in an interview, she says, even though the novel is, is a kind of skewed picture of Belfast in the 1970s, she said, it's not really Belfast in the 1970s. And they said, what she wants is, that, is for it to be, she says, any sort of totalitarian closed society existing in similarly oppressive conditions. So it becomes kind of generalized beyond the historical specificity itself. Um, so by choosing to write in terms of things like defenders of the state, renouncers of the state, the country over the water, the enemy state defending paramilitaries from over the way, uh, what she does is to make it possible to universalize that experience of the novel's protagonist. Um, so so it, in short, the novel, rather than being about Northern Ireland then is absolutely and essentially, she says, about how power is used both in a personal and in a societal sense. So that's really interesting that Burns herself characterized the novel as being about how power is used. And I guess that's one indication of how one might, if one is interested in critique and in what critique does, one might be interested in this book because this is a novel that's about how power is used. Um, and it's a novel that's about how power is used very much from that, as I said, from Nietzsche and in Foucault, from that ground up kind of the micro feelings, sensations, concepts, and so on that are operating at the micro level, rather than the geopolitics of, as I said, you know, centuries and centuries of British Irish politics. It's about what's happening inside these individuals in this really um, compressed hothouse. I was gonna say artificial, it's not an artificial society because that was a real society, was people's real experience, but certainly it's a very intense and one could say, I guess, abnormal human experience, but not exactly an uncommon human experience, because of course there are many times and places today and in the past where people have that experience in their communities. And that's what it's about. It's about that power, the way that power is used. Um, so in that highly fraught context in which offending the sensibilities of one's own community could lead to one's death at the hands of one's own community, uh, the protagonist of the novel tries to thread her way through those multiple threats, right, which are from her, her own neighbors, her own community, and from people outside the community. Uh, the second effect of removing almost all the proper names from the novel is that it's, uh, I think, the, I'm suggesting the individual is decoupled from their proper indexical in a way that is profoundly unsettling. So the protagonist, who is, who is also the first person narrator of the novel, is an 18-year-old woman whose name we never learn. She is variously referred to by others, never referred to her own name. She's referred to by others as, in the whole range of different ways, the reading hall walking person, maybe girlfriend, that's the way her maybe boyfriend refers to her, um, middle sister, sister-in-law, a community beyond the pale. And on one occasion, even she is referred to as the pale adamantine unyielding girl who walks around with the entrenched boxed in thinking. So, so there's this whole range of ways in which she is referred to Net, but never referred to by her name. Um, now, some of these naming practices, I think they have pretty clear parallels in, um, in, in societies in which naming practices are based on family relations. So one sees, for instance, in, in Chinese and a lot of East Asian societies, one would refer to one's sisters as middle sister, younger sister, you know, mother's aunt, father's aunt, elder aunt, younger aunt, and so on. Certainly, certainly this happens. Um, but I think, I think in this context of this novel, I mean, th th certainly that is there as one element, but in this novel, this is generalized to not just the family members, right? It becomes everyone in society is named in this kind of non-naming way. And that's why, that's why it has an, has an impact, I think. Um, so in the context of this novel, I think, and when it's combined with the other more widespread absence of proper names, I think what is conveyed very forcefully is that the protagonist living in this society that's always on the brink of violence is struggling to maintain or even to develop a sense of identity for herself. So she is this, 
she has not named herself. She has received multitudinous forms of naming from other forces in society, which of course we all have anyway, but it's just, that's really just brought into relief and into focus in this novel because of the way the names are replaced with these um, varying monikers throughout the book for everyone, not just for the protagonist. Um, and when we meet her first, she's struggling to such an extent that she's actually li literally, she's literally and metaphorically, in fact, keeping her head down and trying to avoid tension, avoid attention. Um, but ironically, it's that effort to keep her head down and avoid attention, which, which is most best illustrated in her habit of reading while walking, and in fact, reading 19th century novels while walking. And it's her practice of doing that that draws the, neg draws the negative attention, first of all, of her own, of her own principally, in fact, of her own community. Um, so she's already, when we meet her at first, already in danger of becoming one of those community outcasts, or so so-called beyond the pale. So in other words, her own community is going to reject her because, basically because she's trying to opt out of that entire network of values and systems that are dominant in the society. So the way power operates in the society, she's saying, I don't wanna have anything to do with that. I read my 19th century novels, I keep my head down. When I walk, I read my book, I don't pay attention to anyone. I don't want to be noticed. I want to avoid everything that's happening. And even just doing that already makes her a, a target of the hostility of her own community. She's gonna become one of these people who are out excluded and beyond the pale. Um, <clears throat> And the event that pushes her over the limit and in fact starts the, the, the novel is her is the fact that she then comes to the notice of this man who was called the milkman. This man is not the real milkman, that's a different person. This milkman is a leader of one of the one of the paramilitary organizations and basically he begins to stalk her uh, sexually in a sexually predatory way begins to stalk her um, at the beginning of the book and that's kind of what what begins all of the events of the novel. Um, so it's that attention that causes everything to happen that we, we see happen in the book. Um, her response to that stalking is, is muted though by her sense that since there's no, and she says this, we hear this in her inner voice, since there was no threat of actual violence, physical violence from the man, she feels that she doesn't have a basis to complain about this, right? Because she lives in a community which has been racked with physical political violence for many years. And she doesn't think that what's happening, what this man is doing would be acknowledged as being a serious incident given the society in which they live. Um, as one critic represents this or summarizes this, uh, she says, the whole town in fact is engaged in a culturally enforced conspiracy of gaslighting. In other words, the entire social structure is, seems to be telling her what's happening there is not problematic, right? Because he's not hitting you, he's not killing you, he's not blowing you up. So what are you complaining about? So it's very difficult for her to find a way to address what then what she is experiencing. Uh, the problem is though that in, in this case, she is being stalked by a, as I said, a paramilitary leader, um, a man who is a leader of one of the organization, which in the novel is called the Renouncers of the State, which in Northern Irish terms would be the IRA. So there's an IRA leader stalking her um, and that, adds this extra level of potential physical violence in, in the situation that she's in. Okay, the third effect, um, the absence of proper names, I think is that the, the novel then seems to depict this whole society in which nothing is given a proper name. Um, and I think it's important to note here that, that, that this no name convention isn't just, doesn't seem to be just a narrative choice. In other words, it's not just that the narrator doesn't tell us the names of things in the book, in the world, the fictional world, it seems that nobody in this fictional world is using names for those things, right? It's not just that the narrator chooses to talk about the country over the water rather than talk about the United Kingdom or Britain. It's actually everyone is doing that. So it's a world in which there are no proper names, apparently. I mean, that, 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 that seems to me at least to be, the, um, to be, to be what, what is happening there. So, uh, a world without names, it's a world in which nobody dares to speak the names of things. And then that opens up the possibility or the effect. I think one of the effects of the novel is that it has that dystopian effect that a new language is invented in the novel to describe things which otherwise would be described with those set of familiar proper names. So it has that, it's like kind of Orwell's 1984 with this whole new language is invented. 
or elements, for instance, of Margaret Atwood's uh, The Handmaid's Tale, where you have all these neologisms which are introduced into the language in this very, very autocratic, dysfunctional, dystopian society. Um, so what the novel presents then, I think, is a, the consciousness of a protagonist who is struggling to forge a sense of identity and autonomy in a community in which relations of power that are interpersonal, social, state-sponsored and highly gendered threaten to completely crush her agency. So this is the micro world in which she, she is living. And this is what the novelist is showing us at that level that Nietzsche suggests also the philosopher should be looking at that level. Um, so, and, and I think relating that to the idea of the act of vivisection, I think what, it's, what the novel opens up then is, the me is mechanisms through which a society molds and guides that subject formation, along with the corresponding moments of resistance and subterfuge that she cultivates. So the novel is giving us in a way, some of the tools that one might use insofar as one lives, all of us live in societies that are in some way similar to what is described in the book. The novel gives us ways into understanding that and ways into maybe interacting with that and carrying out transformative experiments on that in our own experience. Um, okay, I think that's, do I, oh, well, novels, the, the section of the Titan subjectivity lays bare that, okay, those intricate workings in vivo, as I said, which is an essential part of the idea of vivisection, um, with a potential contribution or um, of interest to people who are interested in the question of critique. Okay, that's the novel. I'm going to leave that to one side and we're doing all right on time. So part three, um, transforming ethical sensibility. Um, okay, so, so, so far in this paper, what I've done is I've suggested that vivisection understood especially as, a, um, as an experimental intervention is a helpful metaphor in thinking about the ends of critique today. And I'm, I've suggested that the, um, in addition to the canonical works of critique in the Western tradition, I think that works of literature, especially novels also engage in that critical endeavor or also can co also contribute to that, to that critical endeavor. Uh, throughout the discussion, maybe not so much in this spoken version, but in the written version throughout the discussion, I, re I refer to what I'm called, at least in the title as well, certainly here, ethical sensibility as one of the potential targets of critical intervention. Um, and now I need to say something a bit more about that. I probably won't say enough to satisfy um, many of the philosophers in the room, but I hope I say enough to give some idea because this requires a lot of further working out on my part for sure. Um, so I'm saying that critique understood in a certain way is an intervention in or an engagement with something I'm calling ethical sensibility. And it's a transformative engagement with something I'm calling ethical sensibility. And I still need to more um, give a more satisfactory definition of ethical sensibility, which I'm not going to give you today, but I will attempt to give you some components of it. Um, okay, so, so that concept then of ethical sensibility, I'm saying is one that I think is helpful in formulating, for me, it's helpful in formulating the, one of the ends of critique. So the way that I think about the ends of critique is that as a transformative intervention in ethical sensibility. Now, how am I going to start giving you some philosophical components for that? Well, let me begin here. Um, in Deleuze's book on Nietzsche, Nietzsche's philosophy, called Nietzsche's philosophy, uh, Deleuze draws attention to Nietzsche's appeal in Daybreak that we have to learn to think differently. Um, now, that push to think differently is, is, of course, a mainstay of contemporary critique. Uh, it's a principle, again, coming back to Foucault, that is, is very much there present in Foucault's work, um, where the critical attitude is based on the need to penser autrement, to think otherwise. Um, and that's a task which, which is followed, at least for Foucault, it's followed by with the challenge of being and doing differently. So thinking differently, leading to doing differently, leading to being differently, all of these things are combined. Deleuze draws attention to this place in Nietzsche's book, Daybreak, where he says, we have to learn to think differently. In Nietzsche's formulation, we have to do that in, for this reason. This is the quote. We have to learn to think differently 
in order at last, perhaps very late on, to attain even more, that is to feel differently. Now, as Deleuze glosses that point, Deleuze says the point of critique is not justification, but a different way of feeling, another sensibility. And again, I might say the point of critique then is not criticism as in negative criticism exposure, for example, as not justification of it, it's not delegitimation of one thing and justification of something else. The point of critique is none of that. The point of critique is, is to arrive at a different way of feeling, a different sensibility. Um, obviously that has resonances with my approach here, thinking about ethical sensibility. The point of critique would be on this Deleuze reading of Nietzsche, the point of critique would be precisely that, to arrive at a different way of feeling. In other words, a different sensibility. What does that mean? Um, so for Nietzsche, the, the, the end of critique is not to arrive at this correct, complete appraisal of the shortcomings of the world or of ourselves, rather the point is to achieve this difference in sensibility. Um, what does that mean? Okay, well, again, preliminarily, I'll say, first of all, obviously sensibility is a very complex and amorphous concept. There's also a concept that has a very long um, history in Western discourse and a long, and I'd be willing to admit and say a long and tortuous history. Um, it's a term that's used, a concept that's used in, in ways that certainly for me, I don't ascribe to nearly all of them or very many of them perhaps even. Um, that I, I suppose could be, and I've thought about it myself, could be a reason not to use the term sensibility, but I still really like the term sensibility, so I'm going to use it. Um, and I want to use it because I really, th I mean, the re and the reason I like it and the reason I want to use it is because I think it, because also because of that complex history, the concept of sensibility actually has a lot of resources within it to, I think, more fully grasp the complex realities that we live in when we think about our, us as ethical beings in the world. And I think what we do need is concepts that can accommodate and grasp and help us to understand complexity rather than concepts that simplify in ways that are arguably oversimplification. So I like sensibility for that reason. And I'll, I'll take all of its baggage with it because I know that it's because of its baggage that it actually has the resources that I want to use. And it has very, very many resources, I think, and a lot of baggage. Um, in my understanding though, so sen sensibility is, in fact, th th this kind of, when I think about this, it, it, I think about it in the way, um, I mean, I, I, think, I think about sensibility, I guess the, 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 main, the main distinction I would want to make is that sensibility for me is, is a mode of activity and is not, it's not a passive receptivity. So we might think of sensibility initially as I'm receiving sensations from the world, I'm a passive blank screen receiving this, but I think sensibility is actually a mode of activity in the world. Um, I think that's a really important point of it. So it's a way of actively perceiving and that perceiving includes both the senses, perception, and knowing, so it's a, it's a sensibility which is both a physical sensibility but also an intellectual sensibility, covers both. And it's also a, 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 let's say it has an element of judgment, of ethical and aesthetic judgment, right? And that's one of the whole range of ways in which, of course, people use the term sensibility. You might go into someone's home or look at someone's work or someone's creation and say, I really like the sensibility that's at play or that's displayed in this work. You're, you're giving a positive aesthetic, potentially ethical aesthetic judgment on something. So I think that's also an important element for me. I mean, that's there and that's important for me. So as a concept, for me, sensibility comprises three interlocked capacities, three interlocked activities. And they are, each of them is kind of bifurcated as feeling, sensing, perceiving, knowing, and valuing, judging. Um, true to my Foucauldian roots, uh, you might see that these three things maybe in some way <laughs> map onto that three-part that three part structure that Foucault has, thinking about, you know, ethics, uh, power, and knowledge, for instance. I mean, we have a similar, similar thing here that, that there is, um, the, 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 I, think, I think that's the, when you try to, when you're approaching ethical experience, ethical reality, you have to have those three, three angles. So this is kind of another version of that within the concept of sensibility. So this is part of the complexity of that concept. It's part of why I like it. 
Um, and it's part of why, of course, it's going to be impossible to give some simple definition of what that is today. Um, okay, just before going to that. So, and then, but what I talk about is ethical sensibility. So look, we have enough problems with the concept of sensibility when you add in ethical, another whole can of worms, what's going on? What will you mean by ethical sensibility? Again, very broadly, very loosely for me, what I'm referring to um, ethical sensib sensibility is the operation of that whole activity in the more or less loosely defined zone of human behaviors that in any given time or place are, are taken to be subject to moral or ethical principles. I realize that's a very self-referential definition. So it's, the, it's that area, that area of our activity as human beings that gets defined as having something to do with ethics that I'm just calling that identifying as the ethical bit of sensibility or ethical sensibility. It's impossible to define for once and for all, of course, what that zone is. And this is something that Nietzsche is there in those quotes from Nietzsche about how not we don't need system building. What we need is to focus on the minutiae of what's happening and how it grows and changes constantly and gets destroyed and modifies. Because I think that zone of behavior, the zone of ethical sensibility of ethical behavior is constantly changing. Um, it's, it's patterns of intensity, it's heat map is constantly changing. Some elements come into it, they gain significance, they lose significance over time and across space as well, of course. So human beings have a massive range of ways of, would have a massive way, way, range of ways of defining or experiencing what would be within that zone. So there's no definition of what that zone is. It's what we take to be in it. At least at the moment, I'm saying that that's my approach. Um, so it's constantly changing um, as certain acts enter, depart from the field of ethical concern. Um, and within that zone, there is a constant conflict and struggle underway, I think, between different modes of sensibility. So it's, it's also something that is constantly in kind of inner, inner turmoil, to put it that way. Um, just for example, I would say that many social campaigns, whether you know, led by, say, governments or, or activists, can be seen as attempts to cultivate in others a particular mode of ethical sensibility. So, for example, when an animal rights activist, um, my, an animal rights activist might want people's ethical sensibility to be reformed uh, or retuned through their exposure to certain kinds of images, whether they're images of battery hens or images of animals being slaughtered for human consumption. Um, so an animal rights activist will want the recipient of those images, the viewer of those images will want their mode of sensibility to be modified by exposure to those images. And similarly, on the other hand, say, for example, an anti-abortion activist will similarly want your sensibility to be modified by exposure to particular kinds of images, for instance, of a fetus. Right? So, it's, so there's this battle going on to modify sensibility, ethical sensibility. Um, so it's a battle of ethical sensibilities, a struggle between conflicting sensibilities, and that plays out in many spheres, in the public sphere, in art, politics, culture, and quite often even within the individuals themselves. <clears throat> so th the next step I wanna make, and I realize according to my own, my own schedule, I'm running out of time here, but um, a couple of the philosophical components, let's say, that will help us to understand that. We've I've talked about Nietzsche a little bit, about Foucault, uh, Deleuze, Guattari, Jacques Rancière is one that will come in, not in this talk, but I hope maybe by the end of this year, I'll give another talk around here somewhere, um, which will be drawing on Jacques Rancière's idea of sensibility. Uh, for the moment, though, I just want to pick out three, two or three reference points just to, to, to set what I'm talking about in, in that kind of philosophical context. So first of all, as I said, William Connolly, who is a political philosopher, one of the only people, I think, one of the few people who a long time ago in 1993 presents this Nietzsche, a, a Nietzsche Foucauldian ethics under precisely that rubric of ethical sensibility. Um, and this is the quote from Connolly. He says, a new sensibility is rendered possible through genealogies, whether those are you know, Foucauldian or Nietzschean genealogies. Um, genealogies, what are they? They are a set of artful techniques to modify these contingent installations, these feelings, these sensibilities. The sensibility that these techniques install function as, function as a corollary 
to the cultivation of virtues in, in teleological theory. So he's saying some kind of philosophical approach will talk about, you know, we have to cultivate virtues. The Nietzsche Foucauldian ethics is saying we need to cultivate sensibilities. It's, it's all about that, that. That's what we do. And one of the methodological tools for doing that is genealogy. That's what Nietzsche and, and Foucauldian genealogy does. It engages with those sensibilities. And in my presentation here, that's one of the things that critique does. It engages with those sensibilities. Um, okay, second point, Gattari. Sorry, I'm scrolling through my other text as well to make sure I'm on the right spot. Um, so, okay, so, so Guattari in this book, Three, Ecolo Three Ecologies, suggests a similar move that will help us to grasp these alt possible potential alterations of subjectivity. Uh, and he suggests that rather than focusing on the subject, we need to think in terms of processes of subjectivation or what he calls vectors of subjectification. Um, th those, so, okay, so instead of thinking of rigid, stable, isolated subjects, we have to think in terms of the ways in which subjects are constantly being formed, sustained, deformed, and reformed. So Guattari invites us as readers to reject the modern Western conception of subjects as the ground and center of human experience and to instead see subjects as always temporary endpoints or as surface phenomena that emerge from a complex web of forces and processes. And here's a quote, vectors of subjectivation do not necessarily pass through the individual, which in reality appears to be something like a terminal for processes that involve human groups, um, socioeconomic ensembles, data processing machines, etc. Therefore, interiority establishes itself at the crossroads of multiple components, each relatively autonomous in relation to the other, and if need be in open conflict. So at the core of human subjectivity, we have this mobile um, um, phenomenon which is happening, which is these vectors of subjectification are creating something. I think that's, for example, something we see in the novel Milkman. We have, we're in the mind and the discourse, internal discourse of that protagonist, and she is at that center of these vectors of subjectification coming from all of these different forces in our society, trying to give her form. And she, and she is struggling with those vectors in, as I said, a kind of a, let's say, in, in the mode in which one would struggle with a form of critique. What interests me about this is that if you can speak, as Guattari does, of vectors of subjectivation, then I think we can also speak about vectors and components of desubjectivation. And that links us back to the very first quote I gave from Foucault, where he describes critique as precisely that, as a mode of desubjectivation. Um, so vectors of desubjectivation would be these elements which, which do that critical work of disengaging us from what th those forces of subjectivation are imposing in any particular given society. Um, I'm going to skip those third. What is the third? Oh, yes. Okay, so I'll very quickly do this. So, so this is just another element here. This is back to Foucault again uh, from a, a 1971 essay of his called Nietzsche Genealogy History. Um, and again, on the idea of genealogy, what is a genealogy or what is a Nietzschean genealogy? Foucault at that time described a Nietzschean genealogy. And this, I point out, is before Foucault himself had done any genealogies of his own. This is the way he describes the, the, the Nietzschean one. It says the analysis of descent, that is what a genealogy, permits the dissociation of the self and the proliferation of a thousand lost events on the site of its empty synthesis. So the genealogy permits this artificial construct of a self to be dispersed, right? You get a proliferation of a thousand lost events on the side of that synthesis. So in other words, for any synthesis of a self, a whole lot of possibilities are discarded and rejected along the way. What the genealogy does is to reintroduce those as possibilities. So producing therefore something like a, um, an, an, an experience or a shock to one's sensibility as one experiences that proliferation of possible modes of subjectivation, which one has not followed, but maybe which one could follow, or at least it opens up that possibility then that one can engage with the mode of subjectivity that one inhabits in order to transform it, which is 
what the critique, in a sense, wants to do. Um, okay, where am I? So in developing that concept, what, what I want to do, and again, I'll just make that connection back to the novel Milkman, that I think that's arguably what, what the novel is offering us is something like what, ne what Foucault says Nietzsche offers us in his genealogies, right? It offers that analysis of how that form of subjectivity emerges in that particular social, social situation. And that can open up that possibility for us to think about different ways in which we and our social situations may embody our subjectivity or different modes of subjectivation that we might pursue. Um, so in developing this concept then, of, and, and all of that within that domain, which I, I recognize I rather poorly or loosely defined as the ethical domain, the ethical zone, the zone of ethics. So I wanna capture that element of individual subjectivity that exists in that interplay between this re really complex interplay between these modes of sensibility of feeling, sensing, knowing, perceiving, and valuing, judging. Um, skip that. So on that, on that analysis, ethical sensibility is open to constant change, both at the level of the individual and even more so, I think, at the level of, at the level of social history. So cha the change is happening anyway. The, mo the, the, the effect of critique is to engage in that and to, to potentially direct it or have some impact on that change, which, is, which we are anyway constantly undergoing. Um, so critique in intervenes in, the, in that conflict that's constantly happening through practices of vivisection, I think. Well, that's what I'm suggesting that disrupt that smooth operation of habitual ethical sensibilities. And thus it opens up possibilities, possibilities for creating new ways of sensing, knowing and valuing. Um, and I will just, yes, leave you then with that, back to that um, way I formulated this at the very beginning of, the, of the, my talk, which is that, so what is the end of critique? One of the ends of critique then on this reading that I'm presenting here, one of the ends of critique is to carry out a transformative engagement with the ethical sensibilities of our time. Um, and that has this vivisective element, or at least one of the ways, one of the metaphors one might use in helping one to understand the way that that happens is precisely that Nietzschean use of, of vivisection as a metaphor for that transformative engagement. And I am going to stop there.